This is Prince George's County Executive Rashawn Baker, and you're listening to the Maryland Crabs Podcast. Live from a grungy kitchen table located in Annapolis, Maryland's scenic and historic capital, it's the Maryland Crabs Podcast. With each episode, your hosts, Tim Hamilton, John Frenet, and the occasional guest will dive in and pick apart the stuff that really matters most to you. We're too lazy to actually solve any of these problems, but we can definitely stir the pot. From schools, politics, parking in the fire lane, to those horrible people who drive BMWs. And here with this week's episode, live from the kitchen table, Tim Hamilton and John Frenet. It's Maryland Crabs time. It's a dreary Tuesday, or Monday, right? And But when you hear this, it's going to yeah, be it's a, Monday. a bright I, Thursday. I so have to think. Look back in history and feel sorry for the past us. Yeah, my days are uh, all running into one another here. And it's, uh, I do that too, but I'm a drinker. Um, yes, we're the Maryland Crabs, and we had a great episode last week, didn't we? That was a lot of fun. I was talking to someone about that recently, about the episodes that I really, like, not, they're all fun. Every one of them is just puppies and unicorns, but... That's uh, just because of my personality. Yes. <laughs> so, but I look at the ones that I thought were particularly fun just because you get a really good rhythm going. And that was, you know, we had good fun with Chase and with Ken Burns and uh, with Sean O'Neill and, Ke- and Alex Pline and, and Jared mm-hmm. Littman. Those are all people who have a fun time when they're here, or at least they are good at faking it. But this one I like because I don't want to dwell on being negative and just picking things apart because it's easy to do that. So whenever we do something like that, I think we make an effort to kind of offer solutions. And this is one that we could, we didn't have to do that, that we could splurge and just be absolutely shitty because it was a crummy situation. Well, it was, it was. And Jimmy DeButts had written a wonderful prophetic editorial for the Capitol before the recent market house vote. And if you have not listened to that episode last weekend or last Thursday, definitely go take a listen. It was a very popular one. Uh, It it certainly is one of our more popular ones. And I think we hit, we resonated with a lot of people. Well, I think what, um, what I was saying was I could feel the frustration by so many people on something that I think everyone has resolved themselves to a fact that it was just has become a dud, which is the market house. And it's become so cliche to make fun of the market house and what happened with it. We kind of calmed down to a dull roar over the last few years and everyone just resolved themselves to the fact that it's never going to be the same as it was. And it wasn't a campaign issue, but if you look at after the vote last Monday, it's become a campaign issue. And I think it's become one of the hottest ones because it just represents the sheer incompetence that can occur within a governmental organization when people decide that they don't want to move a project forward. Well, it is. And I think that, as, as I said in the episode, I said that I think that everybody that was sitting on that council that was running for re-election just took a big ding. I, that, that was so foolish, I think, on every possible strategic meter to well, do which, something like that. Which also brings us to the next question, is their next meeting is September 11th. They just postponed it till September 11th, and I guess the question the remains. Yeah. The question remains is, will they do it on September 11th? I think they painted themselves into a corner, is that, and I think you said that too, saying, look, maybe they did rush into this, maybe this does take some more discussion, but the way that the whole process unfolded was that it made it difficult to move forward on any level and seem competent. So even if they took time to look more into what's involved. My guess is they're going to punt on it again. I think there's so much that's unanswered on the process end from the law, Department of Law, from planning and zoning on the city's behalf that the bidders need that direction. Uh, it's unfair to the bidders or the respondents. The whole process has been unfair to the bidders. Um, you know, the respondents is very unfair to them. Uh, so far, it's already been unfair. Postponing anymore is not going to be any more unfair. But I think they're going to be chicken because you've got a primary race and most of them have a challenger the following week. I don't know, but if you postpone it, that is all of a sudden you're handing your challenger a big, fat, juicy issue to chew on. I, I think know. they've got the issue already is handed to them. You can reasonably make the argument that, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to take the next month or so and have the law office and the non-political aspect of this contract or agreement sort of ironed out so it is, use the term, quote, shovel ready, unquote and allow the next next council to do it. That's just my thought. But I think it was interesting when we had Jimmy here because this just this shows how everyone thinks that they know the, the answer to the market house, and no one does. I had a different opinion than did Jimmy, than did you. I think you, you ask all three of us what should be done with the market house, and all three of us have a different opinion. So I'm not saying that there's an obvious answer that council's missing. I'm not saying that. Right. But I'm saying you got to move forward with something at some point or hand it off to someone who's already successful and proven themselves. 
you know, and, and that's something that they have to do, but they don't want to relinquish control of the process, but they admit up front that they, they are the horrible at this process. Yeah. So at, at some point you got to do something. And again, you get 10 people in this room, there are going to be 10 different opinions about what to do about the No, no, house. you've got to figure out something and, and make the decision as to what the best thing is and move on with it. And not just knowing that you're going to piss off, you know, a constituency, which is fine. Right. And that's not to say that whoever is the best one to do this is not going to have the bumps along the way. You're not going to hand the keys over to someone, some sort of messianic figure when it comes to market houses, and it's going to absolutely take off. I mean, there's going to be some bumps. There's going to be some problems with the city, with the permitting, some parking. There's going to be unforeseen challenges that comes to open the business. But I think the problem is, whereas I say that I get that, I think everyone's patience has run out because this would be, what, the fourth or fifth iteration of the market house? And at that point, you're just going to say, oh, it's a failure again. It's bound not to work. So I think the people who take over for the next iteration of the market house are not going to have much in the way of patience from the general population. And that's not fair to them. It's not a good position to be in. No. All right, let's not beat this dead horse. Let's talk about no. what we're doing this week. We're doing baseball. Yeah. Sort of. What we're doing is we've got uh, Steve Salem, who is the president and CEO of the Cal Ripken Senior Foundation, coming in to talk to us. And how that came about is that we camped out on Cal Ripken's front yard, and he came out the front door and said, get the hell off of my yard, and threw this guy's business card. No. <laughs> but no, we wanted to talk about what the Cal Ripken Senior Foundation is doing, not only across Maryland, but across the United States, and with the at-risk youth of America. And specifically sort of what they've done here in Annapolis, where some people don't realize that they... I didn't realize how big they were. They were they're sprawlingly huge. They're all over the country. I thought it would just be, you know, Maryland, maybe the Northeast Corridor, but they're, they're all over in California. They're in Texas. They're everywhere. And there's, there's some really cool things that they're doing that I didn't realize, um, not just uh, baseball for kids that can run around the bases. So we'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, we want to... Just have one quick sponsor spot there, but if you're listening to this, make sure you're subscribing to us on Apple Podcasts. Give us a rating, give us a review. And the subscribe part, we say that every week, just to explain what everyone knows, is that when you go to find our podcast, not through the website or through Facebook, where you can just click on it and watch the video, but if you go to whatever app your device uses for podcasts and you find our podcast and hit subscribe, that essentially means that every time we have a new podcast or a crab cake, and we're going to talk about that later, you're going to get those automatically downloaded to your devices every Thursday or whenever the crab cake's released. So you don't have to worry about it. I always say it's like subscribing to a magazine. Once you subscribe, anytime there's a new edition, it's just sent right to you. So you don't have to worry about it. I do it. Just this morning, I was listening to the Annapolis podcast. Came in overnight. Yep. When I was walking my circles in the rec center, this is there. And we're one of the few that come. We were noon every Thursday. I don't think we've missed yet. So every Thursday at noon. 12.01 p.m. You know, there, there's Just a, because I'm a little bit weird about whether 12.00 is really a.m. or p.m. Okay. So I go with 01 p.m. There's a bunch of podcasts that I subscribe to that have hard deliveries like that. And I get excited like every Thursday. When a bunch Because Thursday is the magic day for podcasts for some reason. Right. But, but do that. You want to get in touch with us, info at themarylandcrabs.com. Twitter is MD Crabs Podcast. Website is themarylandcrabs.com. And Facebook, you can just search the Maryland Crabs. We've got a page and a group. And I'll tell you what, let's just uh, play this sponsor and we'll get back right into it with Steve Salem, the president and CEO of the Cal Ripken Senior Foundation. Hey, folks, this is Tim Hamilton, your favorite co host of the Maryland Crabs Podcast. Besides being hilarious and charming on this podcast every week, I'm also a marketing professional with clients all over the region. I buy advertising and media for my clients, including TV, cable, newspaper, magazine, Facebook, blah, blah, blah. And this may surprise you, but I still buy direct mail. I know it sounds very 1978, but to be completely honest, if you have a compelling message to convey and you do it in a creative way, direct mail is dollar for dollar one of the best advertising channels out there, especially for small businesses who don't have much in the way of a marketing or advertising budget. And if I decide to use direct mail for a project, I call Post Haste Mailing in Annapolis. I've worked with Jack Ellis, the owner of Post Haste, for almost 15 years now on countless projects, and he is, in all honesty, my number one most trusted vendor. In fact, whenever I find myself in a crisis, a sales slump, an event that looked like it was going to fall on its face, a new product launch that was pushed up a few weeks, my very first phone call is always to Jack. He always gives me the answer I need. Maybe not the answer that I want, but one that gets me out of that particular jam. I'm not kidding. He has saved my job on more than one occasion. Seriously. So what does Post Haste Mailing do? Well, they do mailings. Duh. That's in the name after all. But it's Jack's decades of experience that gives you the best bang for your marketing buck. Do you want to micro-target certain customers or neighborhoods or businesses? Jack can pull a list for you that makes sure that your mailing gets into the hands of your target demographic without the advertising waste that you get with other media. That means that if you have a small budget, 
you can still get the results you need. And if you need printing done, post haste mailing can do that too. Postcards of any size, pamphlets, variable data printing, cut sheet laser printing, and a bunch of other printing terms that I don't understand. But Jack understands them, and he knows what's best for my business and how I can get the best bang for my buck. So if you're a business owner and you've never considered direct mail, give Jack at Post Haste Mailing a call to see what he can do for you. I promise you that you will be surprised at the options you didn't know were available to your business. Who knows? Maybe someday Jack can save your job too. And we are here coming from the Commons again, overlooking beautiful and today wet West Street in Annapolis, Maryland. And we have Steve Salem with us, who is the executive director or president, sure, that's CEO good. Yeah, of that's the Cal good. Ripken Senior Foundation. And obviously anybody that has listening to this that has been in Maryland for more than a week or two knows the name Cal Ripken, certainly yeah. with his uh, illustrious career with the Baltimore Orioles. And we get the sightings around town, too. Yes, mm-hmm. we do now. Like Sasquatch sightings, you get the pictures <laughs> and he's gone. <laughs> he's real, though. He's big. And, and, then, and then also, of, of course, there is a field that is here in town, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, that is the responsibility, or, or you guys are responsible for bringing it to us, which is just a phenomenal Thank you. thing there. And we wanted to talk about, uh, we all know about Cal the player and we know about Billy the player and they established this foundation the two of them correct correct and to, the, and their family to honor Mom, sister Cal and Billy's father Cal Ripken senior right also a longtime player manager with the Baltimore Orioles how did how did the foundation start well as you just said Cal senior passed away and the family wanted to carry on his legacy which uh, had been helping kids who needed a little bit of a little guidance in their life, a helping hand. Cal Sr. lost his dad when he was young. Uh, And you hear Cal and Bill talk about it. Weekends would come around and their dad was out at the park with kids in the neighborhood, whether they were in Maryland or Iowa or Rochester, wherever it was he was managing, coaching. That's where he'd be on weekends. So if they wanted to spend time with him, they would go and have to go with him to the park. So it was important to him to help these kids who didn't have the same opportunities that some of the other kids had. And so the legacy they wanted to carry on was helping kids who needed a helping hand. And they, you said they sort of traveled with their dad to be with him on weekends when he was on the road? Yes. So... You know, and I I won't do the story justice to really want to hear Cal and Bill tell it. (laughs) But sure, when he was managing in little towns around America or coaching or even playing, I'm sure the family would be with him in some cases. Uh, And in other cases, it was here at home when he was coaching in Maryland. So this need was probably ingrained as a for both Cal and Billy as at a really young age. No doubt. Really didn't manifest itself until late or after their major league careers. That's right. Cal was still playing. Cal Sr. passed away in 1999. Cal was still playing. And I think Billy had just left the game. So yeah, you know, tail end of Cal's career, end of Billy's career. And What does, I mean, you're, you're out there working with kids and whatnot. What does the Cal Ripken Sr. Foundation do? So our mission is to help at-risk kids, provide them with opportunities that they're not going to get at home. Uh, these are kids who typically come from a single parent family inner city type neighborhood where the opportunities for advancement opportunities to assist you in becoming a productive contributing adult don't necessarily exist and if they do these kids don't know where to find it anyway and so our mission is to help these kids provide them with opportunities so that they can move forward in life that's the nice way of saying it the reality the the for practical purposes what you're talking about are kids who as i said they grow up in single parent families They may or may not ever see that single parent. They're really being raised by their great-grandmother, their great-great-grandmother. Without somebody intervening in their lives, they have no chance. And a male figure, too. Yeah, that's right. You know, and think about that, being raised by your great-great-grandmother. I could not tell you who my great-great-grandmother was. I did not grow up in an especially successful family. I don't know who my great-great-grandmother was. I don't know who my great-grandmother was. They're being raised by their great-great-grandmothers who's 50, 55 years old. You know, it's something that most of us can't relate to. And when you see, you know, when the rioting took place in Baltimore and the newscasters, of course, were 24 seven, right? Where are the parents? Hey, talk about disconnected from reality and not understanding the issue. There are no parents. You know, my son plays uh, pal football. So in Annapolis, a lot of the participants come from public housing. And I'd see those boys come to and from 
practice carrying their equipment up and down a busy street thoroughfare in the middle of Annapolis. And I, you never saw any parent whatsoever. And yeah. this was during fall, so they'd be going home at night in the dark. And they'd be hitting people up for money for McDonald's because the only food they get during the day, a lot of them, is the programs that they get in the schools. That's exactly right. A lot of these kids, you go into West Baltimore, for example, or Southeast Washington, D.C., and you meet with these kids, they will tell you the only reason they go to school is because they're hungry. I mean, how sad is that? Wow. Yeah, there's, and there's a program, uh, Jared Lippman, who is Ward 5 Alderman here in Annapolis, he had a pro, he, he honored uh, a woman in town who coordinates the food program at the grade schools uh, along in Annapolis, and she provides them with some of these kids with the only meals they get in a day. Yeah. You know, and if there's a snow day, they're not eating. You know, if there's a holiday, they're not, and it's just, you, you kind of, it's easy to have kids like this that are stuck in these lousy housing projects, and it's easy to forget that they exist, and you know, you only see and them. You'll, and you'll, on those snow days, what you see is a kid eating a bag of potato chips quickly and then chugging a coca-cola to get that fake full sensation right i mean it's just it's heartbreaking well specifically on i mean working with at-risk youths i mean what are the specific programs you have i do know that you're that you're building fields for yeah. communities and uh, we'll touch base on the uh, wiley Bates legacy center but you do have several different programs that you work we with do at risk youth we have as you touched on we have our we call youth development park initiative and we're building synthetic turf or as cal likes to say replicated grass parks across the country and we can talk more about that if you'd like but as is that his today, replicated grass is that his term <laughs> yeah, that, they, well, you know, synthetic turf, yeah, they, you'll hear that, that in other places too, but yeah, he was the first one I heard it from. Uh, synthetic turf, astroturf, it has such a negative connotation because you guys remember when we were kids, the athletes you can buy it hated, hated because it, it was like, you know, it was on concrete and they would slide and they'd get hurt. It's not that way today at all anymore. It's as soft or as softer than grass. So, yes, replicated right, grass. Right. But, so we've built 68 of those parks across the country. We have another probably 30 or 40 somewhere in the works from the planning stages to Back construction. Back up again. 68 parks across the country. Yeah, coast to coast. And for those that are in the local area to Annapolis, check out the – it's the Ollie's Field. And I totally screwed yes. up the full name of it, but it's Ollie's, Ollie's Bargain, Bargain Outlet. Ba- Bar- okay, Bargain Outlet Field, which is at the Bates Legacy Center. And it, it's a beautiful field. It's a beautiful facility. Uh, multi-purpose. It's not just baseball. Right. And are all of the fields multi-purpose as well for the most part? They are designed to be multi-purpose fields, parks. With the center S- city to baseball? Some of the parks are only, you know, it depends on space mm-hmm. and resources, money available to build. Some of the parks are built as little baseball fields. So that's our shtick, maybe, if you- uh, because of the Ripken name, baseball well, sure. is Why what wouldn't we it be? use to leverage and to get kids involved and get them active. But it's not about baseball. Uh, so whether it looks like the Bates Field, which is a big rectangle, or a little baseball diamond, to us, they're multi-purpose fields. The kids can play kickball, dodgeball, baseball, wiffle ball, marbles, tag. We don't care. It's a safe place in a tough neighborhood for a kid to go outside and play, whatever they feel like playing. Marbles, <laughs> and and, and, you, and no one does it anymore. I don't think. I, just, well, yeah, I did. The little sideways yeah. cap going. Hey, Jimmy, I'm going to get your cat side. <laughs> Didn't go on my paper route. And, and Annapolis is not necessarily a you know when you on the surface you look at it and say oh this right. is the this is a tough neighborhood because right. it, it is a fairly safe area to be right. in. It's um, but you're not if going, you're not in public housing. It is yeah yeah well you're not, but you're not going into the Annapolis. I mean you are going into some of the inner cities and some of. We're going into some of the toughest neighborhoods in America, but using Annapolis as a point, those kids at the Bates Boys and Girls Club, where we built this field, are every bit as entitled to the opportunity to play as a kid in West Baltimore or South Central Los Angeles or inner city Phoenix. So while our focus is tends to be more on the, what we think of as a traditionally tough, distressed community, kids are kids and they all have a right to be able to play safely. And the parents or grandparents or great grandparents have the right to know their kid is safe when he's at, he or she is outside playing. When was the first field put in? The first field was finished on December 7th, 2010. And that was 33rd Street in Baltimore, where Memorial Stadium used to be. 
Fantastic. Today, Memorial Stadium is our first youth development park. Home plate is exactly where it was when Brooks and Cal oh. and Boog and Frank played. That little white house in left center is out there. Oh, that's wild. Yeah. And how has it been has it been kept well? Yeah. Well, the thing about the replicated grass is it's hard to ruin it. This field, with the exception of the wear that takes base place around the bases, especially home plate, the field looks brand new. Looks like it did on day one. Do you find that there's a problem with vandalism at any of these schools? Or I mean- uh, there hasn't been. That was our big concern. One of the reasons we use synthetic turf is because of the maintenance costs of grass fields. And the expense is just too high, even if they have the technical ability and, and knowledge as to how to take care of a field, most don't. Which is, which is, which is an entirely exactly. Different, you can probably attest to that, but, Tim. But one of the things we're trying to relieve the community of is the maintenance costs of these fields. And so we invest more at the beginning to build a field but then over the course of time, there's no question that it saves the community money. So you're not finding the, a oh, the, vandalism. the, the neighbor, the vandalism. So our concern is not the maintenance cost, which is usually the concern on a mm-hmm. park. It's the security. And so we pick our local partner carefully. We don't own these fields. We donate them to the local organization that we partner with. Like and, and as far as constructing them. Boys and girls clubs, schools. Gotcha. But as far as constructing them, you come up with the funds. Yes, we do it together. Okay. So there's a, a group. Yeah, here's here's how it works. So the Bates field, let's use that Mm because it's right around the corner. If you were to build that on the open market, it's probably because of the environmental regulations and things we had to deal with. It's close to $2 million field. That's what it would cost you if you bid it out and paid full fare. Probably $3 million if they had to deal with permits for the city of Annapolis. Okay, there you go. (laughs) I'll throw that out there. Well, so instead of the $2 million, because we have a real expertise in this and build so many, our pricing is very good. There's an economy of scale. And there's no question. We built it, I, I don't remember the exact price, but probably a million three fifty. Okay. Is so that average, say, you think? Uh, average is about a million one now. Okay. used to be about a million. It's definitely creeping up. So we built it, let's just say a million three fifty, a field that would have cost you two million. We then raised probably 600000 650000 of the 1.3. Mike Bush contributed about a half million dollars through the legislature. Right. Uh, the city and the county contributed and some private donors in Annapolis contributed. So for the cost of about $650,000, the community got a $2 million field. So it's a great investment. So you do we this put so real often skin in the game. That you do it so often that you can pretty much go from place to place and know all the switches to flip. Like you know exactly. Yeah, it varies. But I mean, but, but, yes. but you know pretty much how to capture the Absolutely. Mod- so, you, so you can move. It seems like you move pretty quickly because I'm looking at the map you have right here, and of course you have the urban centers. You know, I can pick out. You know, there's Houston, there's uh, uh, Minneapolis, there's you know uh, D.C., et cetera. But you're also in areas that are pretty rural, which is North Dakota, South Dakota, Idaho, and you now those aren't where we have fields necessarily that's where we have a presence gotcha so what's the difference between the two well we have 68 feet other programs we probably have 600 communities where we've run our programs all 50 states well let's talk let's talk about some of the other programs so right that which is what we started on so we also that we have our fields we also have a series of incredibly uh impactful programs one of which is called badges for baseball and think of this in today's environment where police and kids in inner city communities across America are literally shooting each other, right? Including in Baltimore. We go in, we use baseball as a hook, we bring together the police officers and kids from communities like West Baltimore, and instead of shooting each other, they're talking, and they're playing baseball while they talk, and they're developing a relationship which up to this point has only been negative. Police only go in when they're there for in the minds of the kid, a bad reason like pulling their brother out of the house. Sure. Now they're going in to say who wants to play a little ball. And there's a curriculum that we've developed which teaches uses baseball as the hook, but it's used to teach kids life lessons like perseverance, positive thinking, nutrition, personal accountability, so hanging out with the right group of kids. And why those things are important. Why is it important if you're playing baseball? Why is it important to your teammates to persevere? But much more importantly, why is it important when you go back home to persevere? And, you know, the programs run differently from project site to project site, of course. We just give them guidelines and a curriculum and all the tools they need to run the program. 
but it's transformational. And it's not that we are transformational, but when you bring police officers and these kids together, it is transformational. And now these kids who would be killing other kids and police officers and who knows what are considering, this was a side effect we didn't even think about, they're considering law enforcement as a career because now the coach is a police officer and everyone, who doesn't want to be like the coach Cop, when cops, you're a kid? The cops are cool now. Yeah. I remember there was a viral video a while ago down in Orlando, I think it was, and some cops rolled up on some kids that were shooting hoops in oh, the yeah. street and they got out and they were getting, the cops were getting beat and he said, we're calling for backup. And all of a sudden another car rolls with Shaq, you know, with Shaq comes out. Oh, and, right. and, and, and I did see that. But, but, but again, again, yeah. it was, it was really, it was like, well, no, you know, the cops are rolling up and maybe it's a dance off. Maybe it's a, a baseball game. Maybe it's a football game or a basketball exactly. game. Exactly. It really does. Well, it's um, a very it's complex dynamic talking. is that you forget that uh, we said before, stereotypically, a lot of these boys don't have men in their lives. So the only men that they have in their lives uh, that they have regular contact with, again, stereotypically would be the police officers and they're seen as adversaries. But if you put them together, not only does it fulfill that need to have that male influence, but it also creates a positive attitude towards the police. Because a lot of these kids don't do anything wrong, exactly. but they have a bad attitude by the police because they're around that all the time. And they have a exactly. fear, even though even if they've never had an interaction with them per se, they've seen it all the time. They've had these leagues all over the country for years, which is PAL, which is, you know, police uh, athletic, league. athletic leagues. And they've mostly been football and basketball. But I mean, and they're um, moderately successful. Some right. of the PALs are and they're great. all very different. Some of yeah. them are not good, but that's the case with any national organization that has affiliates some of them are great some of them are terrible mm -hmm. most are in the middle somewhere i know in, in locally here we've got a, a cop named taylor piles who has established a nonprofit called the blue ribbon foundation and what they do and it's, it's sort of grown nationally a little bit it's not nearly to the scope of uh cal Ripken senior foundation but backpacks with it's great very common stuff that you need to deal with foster children as they move through the system so it's familiar stuff it may be maybe a teddy bear and it may be some toothpaste and it may be a blanket that's comforting or something along those lines that as children move from home to home or from facility to facility he gives it to be able to do it maybe it's you could give me the officer's name we would love to find a good connection in this area that sounds like a great program consider that done i'll yeah. make sure that you guys make the yeah. connection on that when we're done here on that but you go beyond that i mean baseball i mean i know i i saw that you've got like the healthy choices healthy right. children program those are the life that so the healthy choices healthy children curriculum is the curriculum we use the life skills and it's based on the lessons cal senior taught cal and billy and thousands of other ball players, major league and minor league that we never heard of, like perseverance, right? And, and personal accountability and showing up every day. If you say you're gonna do something, do it. That's what the Healthy Choices curriculum is. Make the right choices in life. And we try and teach them how to do it and why it's so important to do it. Okay, so that's not a um, healthy choices or just good choices. I mean, is it does that's it jump right. into nutrition? It does. Or to a point? It does. It has, it has a little bit of a, we a, have a, a Michelle Obama kind of a healthy definitely. nutrition ring to nutrition. it. Nutrition. Our curriculum, when I say curriculum, really what they are are flip books that fit in your back pocket. And we call it back pocket programming. So that a school gym teacher, health teacher, a boys and girls club worker, the YMCA counselor, has a little booklet that they can put in their back pocket, pull out and give the lesson for the day. The nutrition booklet is very basic, talks about, and we uh, worked with some folks at the Mayo Clinic, a national health magazine and my staff to develop these lessons. Why is an apple better for you than a candy bar? You, you know, these are basic things, but these kids don't know that. Well, bad food's cheap, too. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. where the poverty belt in the country follows the obesity belt. They're all the same. It's, you know, if you get no certain doubt. food assistance, that it's that you can spend money on soda is very cheap. You can get a, a two-liter soda. And it fills you up. It's amazing. And our programs are written for middle school age kids, so the lessons have to be uh, more basic. So you're looking at, what, 7 to 14, to 14 type? Um, I, I really, you know, our focus is 5th grade to 8th grade. Okay. But in reality, 4th grade to ninth grade, primarily. You know, I'm looking, you've got the summer camp program, and I know there was, we were talking a little before we started, I, my son participated in the Ripken summer camps for right. two summers, and I know that the Cal Ripken Senior Foundation... Um, which is a separate entity, right. also has these summer camps. Are they the same 
camps? We type? built no, but we or, we stole all the good ideas that Ripken Baseball all the best ones staff are had <laughs> repurposed. In that's turn, yeah, we, we call it repurpose. We like, love to see, repurpose. Yeah, um, repurposed grass. Repurpose. They <laughs> just camp. They teach us and work with us on the baseball skills because we do want the kids to play baseball and learn. And some of these kids want to play baseball. And sometimes these kids have great athletic talent that nobody knew about. Sure. So they get on the baseball field. These kids. That's like the American the, Idol of sports. I mean, yeah, you get out there in and a you're way. Like, Whoa, where did this talent come That's from? That's right. That's exactly right. They hold that bat split handed because they've never held a baseball bat before. If they throw with the right hand, they think their glove goes on the right hand. And so it's re these are not baseball players, but some of them are sensational athletes. But the Ripken baseball staff, these are it's a professional baseball operation. We train, they train my staff, they train the police officers, uh, some of the coaches and mentors. We call them coaches, but boys and girls club type worker. Right. Who are required to come to camp with their kids. And then in addition to playing ball, which we do in the morning, and by the way, you have the United States Marshals, Maryland State Police, local police, D.C., Montgomery County, and out again, there that brings competing the with the kids. Right. Yeah, with the bomb dogs, drug dogs, helicopters, SWAT units, all the fun, but in a good way. Um, so they play baseball in the morning. Then we go back to a camp. We put them up on the um, Chesapeake Bay. Okay, this is all Northeast, up in North Maryland. Northeast, yeah. right. Exactly, up in Northeast. Oh, and we do life skills. Camp there. She had it. We just got it from camp last week. And she isn't that the one with the big uh, the ropes zip course. ropes? Yeah, there, we, there's, we were there's just two camps there. out there that we use. Yes, one way down at the has, end of the. Yes, one <laughs> yeah, of them has. You a need a ladder to get one. to one of them. Is that, <laughs> yes. that far down in Maryland? It's exactly. Just, yeah, it's exactly. a cool little town, though. So these kids now. Okay, it's a beautiful little town right on the water. These kids have never been out of. Not only have they never been out of. Let's say we bring them from Houston because we bring kids from all over America. All expenses paid by us. Come from Houston to our camp. Not only have these kids never been outside of Houston before, and they've never been on an airplane before, they've never been outside of a two or three block radius of their home. I know a guy in, in Annapolis, he's 60 years old. He grew up in public housing. He's now at the Timothy House. He said he's never been further than, in 60 years, he's never been further than parole. That's as far as he's been. In his and there are, some, there are some that have never been down to City Dock to see the bay. Yeah, and these are little kids. Crazy. So they really yeah. have never been. So all of your, your summer camp that you that the Cal Ripken Senior Foundation does, that is held here locally in Maryland, correct? Held in Maryland. We do smaller camps and clinics, one and two day camps around the country. Okay. But our summer camp is, is here. Is here at the facility. And you at use the facility the, in Aberdeen, and we use the camp out in Northeast. Okay. Typically. Question is, I know... During the Ripken baseball camps, which is a you know is is a pay to go camp, and you really right. learn some you know some major skills coming through there for youth that are interested in baseball. And Billy and Cal are both very hands on and while there are they uh, personally yeah. hands on in this. I mean they're so yeah, and you know it's gotten to the point now where I think I take it for granted. Nobody cares more about these kids than those two guys. Cal and Bill are so mm -hmm. committed to this. Bill's in New York a lot now mm -hmm. doing his MLB broadcast, but these guys are so passionate about making a difference. So their fingerprints are all over everything all on this. Over it. This was their vision. What we did was help show them how we're going to get there. How did, how did you come aboard here? I was with Boys and Girls Clubs of America. Okay. I was helping to run the government relations office in D.C., the headquarters was in Atlanta. Boys and Girls Clubs of America was in Atlanta. Cal Sr. and Vi, Cal and Bill's mom, helped start the Boys and Girls Clubs in Harford County, Maryland, Aberdeen, and Greater Aberdeen. And so I got to know them a little bit and had a real, didn't know Cal and Bill, had a relationship with Vi and knew Cal Sr. a little bit before he passed away. And I got a phone call one day from a mutual friend. Would you be interested in helping? I said, sure. I mean, I was going to help for free. Some little piddly foundation up there. Sure, and we, my hand. You know, it was just <laughs> just starting up. Which is exciting, actually. And, and we, we raised... Oh, yeah, yeah. And we, we raised some money. I just did it on the side. We raised some money for to build, help build Cal Senior's yard and to help get the foundation started. And I guess three years later, I went over full time. Now, we also you also mentioned we've got the... Annapolis, the youth development fields that we built here, and you've got 63 of them, and you said like 30 or so in the in the works. Yeah. You also mentioned about Ability Fields program. Yes, right. And this stems not necessarily from the, not solely at-risk youth, which we tend to think of as 
inner city, single parent, right. uh, perhaps public housing, lower income type of a, of a thing. But this extends a little bit beyond that. That's right. And we stumbled onto it. We've st- most of what we do, we actually stumbled onto. That's, if you that's, want that's life in general. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's uh, no plan. So we, as I said, the first field we completed was Memorial, Old Memorial Stadium, that site. But the first park we started on was in Fredericksburg, Virginia. And we ended up there because Doris Buffett, Warren Buffett's sister, called us one day. Cal and Warren are friendly. She called one day and said, my brother said I need to call. You guys are in my backyard and I have a project you might be interested in. Will you, got, will you come down? So we went down to talk to her, an associate of mine and I. When Warren Buffett's sister calls, you go. I'm- <laughs> That's right. <laughs> She's got a foundation called the Sunshine Lady Foundation, and she wanted to build fields for kids in Fredericksburg. She didn't want to work with the city, wanted to know if we would help her. And if we would raise a million dollars, she would give us a million dollars. Well, this was at the very beginning. We're trying to raise money to keep our lights on. And here's this woman saying, I'll give you a million dollars. If we didn't know what she was talking about, well, yeah, we'll build a field, sure, or whatever. <laughs> Had no idea what we were getting into. <laughs> Honest to God, I thought you just, you know, literally roll out the turf and nail it down. Well, about five years later, we finally finished that field. That was our second or third park complete. But that's how we stumbled into it. Well, in that community, the only piece of property really we could get was a big nine acre lot that needed a lot of site work. So we just graded the whole thing. So there was room for another field. And a special needs group from down there, I don't know if it was the Miracle League, but they're based in Fredericksburg, came to us and said, we'd love to put a field in for our kids. Would you help us? And that was my, personally, my first experience working with a group like that. And I wasn't aware of the issues like we are today. And we said, sure, we'd be happy to work with you, tell us. And you know, and it turns out that these kids are at risk in a different way. Uh, They come from, typically they come from wonderful, caring families in a wonderful, caring community, but they don't have a place to play either. And limited by their physical disability. Exactly. And so what you need is a very thin poured rubber field or a very thin replicated grass field so that the wheelchairs, the crutches, whatever their need is, they're able to move on that playing surface and they don't exist very expensive and they just don't exist and so these groups end up playing in parking lots and it's really sad thing they have the same right that these that all kids have to have a field of their own and so in fredericksburg we built our first what we call ability field but it's designed for special needs field geico is the title sponsor of that now is this something that you uh, you said that they didn't have the field it wasn't invented yet with the alternate grass. What's the alternate grass? Well, the, the, not that it wasn't invented. But, it's expensive. They have them. Um, when I say they don't exist, what I meant to say was they're, they're far and few between. Or is it few and far between? At uh, least outside, they uh, school, become, outside high schools and such. You know, well, even high schools, parks. they don't. Yeah, but they don't have fields for these kids right. that meets their needs. No, no, I meant in general. When you say the fields are around, I know for the, for the special needs kids, that that's very specific. Yeah, but that, that's what I'm talking right. about, the special needs right. kids here. And so we've now built, I want to say 12 or 13 wow. special needs fields. They cost about a half million dollars a piece. That's going to be a huge draw, like, because you're not going to have a exactly. town. You're not going to have that many in a town, but you know, people from neighboring communities and everything, that's got to be pretty huge. It's a larger population that I was aware right. of. And they become regional destinations. People come from hundreds of miles to bring their son or daughter to play on these fields. We've built a field at the Maryland School for the Blind, at Kennedy Krieger. They've got a school that focuses on special needs kids in Fredericksburg, with the Los Angeles Dodgers out in L.A., and and many others. Now, do you you run, just out of curiosity, I know through various entities, whether it be this foundation or Ripken Baseball, you run the tournaments and and whatnot. Do you run through the foundation a tournament for special needs? We don't get into running tournaments. We don't do that at all. Are there organizations? But the special needs groups do. Absolutely. Okay, Okay, good. Absolutely. That's where I was getting at to make sure that it was all all fine and good to sit there and be able to practice and have a a scrimmage or a a game among Yeah, they absolutely do. To get into the... That's that's fantastic. So it looks like you had about 25 in the pipeline, at least that was listed on the uh, on the map I saw, but how many do you have total of our youth development parks? Mm-hmm. So today we have sixty eight, and, and it's coast over. to coast. I think twenty states. Yeah, mostly I saw it concentrated on the East Coast, but you did have a good bit in Texas. Concentrated and on the East Coast because just population. It's well, yes, but it's also much more. Um, 
price friendly. Really? If we stay closer to where we are. Well, oh. sure, because some of the issues that you get into building a field in Seattle don't necessarily exist in Baltimore. And the, it causes the price to go up. But uh, have to do with the location staff, and manufacturing. And well, all we that? have to manage the project. My staff is, goes out, makes regular site visits. The company that we use to build our parks is ninety-five uh, percent of our parks is a company called Fields Inc. The farther they go, the more their travel costs are. So, how do you raise money for the uh, foundation? Shipping for the turf, like any other nonprofit organization. It's a, we, we're not a private foundation. We're a public five hundred one c three corporation. We raise our budget every year, uh, and we do it the way any good nonprofit does. We've got some special events. We go to major donors. We're constantly cultivating relationships. We do things like this to get the word out. You never know who's going to hear and have an interest. We have someone in Annapolis who's interested now. And hey, if you're listening, parks. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> come on, spell name. Got names? <laughs> Throwing out some names. <laughs> uh, one of our special events is a wine tasting mm -hmm. that we hold here in Annapolis every year. Yep, down there off of... Um, I think we've held it 10 times. I think this was our 10th year. Where is it? It actually used to be in the uh, mansion that burned down. Ooh, that's right. Um, several years ago, where they where those uh, four children died. Where the tree... Oh, yeah. Oh, way to bring it Very down. sad. Yeah, and really, really They now have it in the, in the barn family. back there along... Um, well, yeah, now we... Harness we, Creek. Not great for us. This year we used... Um, I'm drawing a blank on the name of the restaurant. Right on the water. The Ebb Tide. No. no. <laughs> Severnin. No. Carol's Creek. Uh, no, now you're Chart making house. me look bad. Chart House, thank you. There we go. <laughs> sure, time go to the Chart House. Let's do some creative try. editing here. <laughs> uh, and then we did a VIP party afterwards at Cal's House. It all was right. fun. You know, and you, we probably raised a quarter million dollars. All the proceeds from that event and any other event we do go to support the kids. So just as an overview, so you, you, you're like any other 51C3, you raise money, uh, you have uh, called corporate partners and sure. what have you. So you have the camps, you have the programs, you have the fields. So you, you got your fingers in a lot. Uh, we have our much. fingers in a lot and uh -huh. there's a lot of need. Right. And that's why we're doing it. Uh, m my philosophy, Cal's, Bill's, you know, my board's philosophy is someone else can do the easy work. While we have the ability to do this, we want to do the hard stuff. And so we don't back away from it. This year we have to raise $33 million to build these fields that we're trying to build, to put on the events, to reach the kids, to bring them to the summer camp, and we'll do it. And you increase that every year, huh? Uh, knock on wood, it's been increased every year. Even during the recession? Even during the recession. Wow. We have not had it down yet. We had the 2000, I think it was nine. That's when it kicked. You know, we probably that's had the year that scared the hell out of everyone. Growth, but yeah. But yeah. If you grew anything in 2009, that was worth doubling in size. <laughs> Even that's... was... That was when 10% down was, was right. you were doing you fine. hoped for it. That's yeah. right. Well, I think it's pretty phenomenal. I mean, obviously, you're very fortunate to have a, a masthead for Cal Ripken. No doubt. To be able to do that. But you look at some of the professional athletes that are doing some wonderful things. I mean, we've talked to, uh, you know, you look at uh, Ravens the Ra Ravens. Ravens do a great job. You look at... Um, and I'm saying you know, that's even, a even fan. look at Ray Rice, what he's doing for you know domestic abuse, and right. uh, you know we'll throw it out there. Michael Vick with you know for the SPCA, he's been the greatest fundraiser for the SPCA. Well, court order has, has ever seen. I mean, well, I mean, you know, he's he's turned around and and whatnot. But I think you look at these professional athletes that have done it. But you've you've got you know arguably one of the greatest athletes of all time. Yeah, uh, that's. I wouldn't even say lent his name to your organization, but is your organization and has uh, put his fingerprints all over it. Yeah. Um, He's a great human being. And my board of directors, I don't know if you've looked that deeply at us. It's a, unlike almost any other nonprofit board in America. I mean, it's amazing. And there's, a, there's, a lot of diversity. there's a lot of diversity on that board. And, and I mean, it's not necessarily, you know, look, it's, it's not the Waltons. It's not Warren Buffett. It's not loaded up with all of these huge, big shot, big money names uh, necessarily. And it, it does, you're right. It does look We would much, take those guys if we, could, and women, absolutely. If we could get them. But it's a powerful, powerful board. Probably by the end of the calendar year, 65, 70% of my board, which is a 40-member board, that's huge. Uh, will have either given or raised $100,000 or more. I mean, it's an amazing board. It's each. unheard of in the nonprofit world, each. Right. It's unheard of. Right. So how do you herd 40 cats? I mean, board members. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> fortunately for me, I don't have to. They're fabulous. Absolutely fabulous. We do have an executive committee, which has the authority to act on behalf of the full board. And the executive committee is 10 or 11 members. 
So for practical purposes, that's how you run the organization with a board that large. And it's pretty consistent, but do you don't have a lot of turnover with the board? We have some turnover. I mean, it's normal. But not a lot. Yeah. We have less than most, probably. Because oh, that's a huge uh, board. That's Yeah. For a national organization, though, it's not. But it's getting big, yeah. How many employees right. does the Cal Ripken Senior Foundation employ? We have a, probably 31 or 32 employees now. Do you have any idea how much Cal Ripken Baseball or Ripken Baseball employs? I don't know. But, okay. I mean, really, it's a completely separate right. entity. But they have a lot of seasonal staff with mm-hmm. minor leagues, with their summer camps. The summer camps with and the, the programs. Tournaments. And the, right. Yeah, so... That, that would not be a fair comparison, but yeah, we, we're, we've grown into a very large, you know, this year, hopefully $35 million national nonprofit organization, and there aren't many of those, in the world of youth-serving organizations. And you, you pretty much do it all. I mean, you've got, you obviously got fundraising. You act as a project manager or construction manager on your Move and Dirt projects. You've got program managers for the programs that you're right. doing. You've got educators. And then everything else that goes with it, marketing yeah. people and, yeah. and and everything else, which is... Uh, we run very much like an entrepreneurial, fast-moving, for-profit company. That's by design. And this... It's harder as we continue to grow, but that's by design. And remind me, when we first started, is, you said this started in 2000... 2000 Cal Senior passed away in 1999. Right. The organization started in 2001. But for the first few years, first of all, Cal was had not retired yet. And for the first few years, they were trying to find their way, figure out what it is they wanted to do, how they were going to get there, what they're supposed to be doing. And so around 2005, 2006, things really started happening. Yeah. So in 17 years, you've gone from just an idea with some talented baseball players to this. Yeah. Well, you know, it takes passion and that's what my staff has. That's what the board has. I said, Cal and Bill have more passion than anybody when it comes to these kids and so we're really f- very fortunate and they hired you away from the boys and girls club yeah you're here for the duration i'm here as long as cal wants me around how do we um learn more about the ripkin foundation cal ripkin senior foundation where do we send our checks we have a um. wonderful website <laughs> um ripkinfoundation.org all the information is on there information about our programs about our parks how to get involved what's the latest that's been going on our events do you look for volunteers to help out at the programs in the summer camps and whatnot we do okay we absolutely do and that would would that be applicable to older i'll say young people the 18 to 21 yes of course but it, it it varies i mean number one our program sites are always looking for volunteers those local nonprofit youth organizations live on volunteers. Sure. Um, and so that's typically where we would send potential volunteers. But we also look for them at, the, at our headquarters and in our summer camps and for our special events. It depends on the setting. I mean, volunteers it, it can be hard to manage sometimes, mm-hmm. even though it's all well-meaning and people just want to help make a difference. It's not always as easy as it seems. Well, if you're here in Annapolis, make sure you go down to the Bates Legacy Center and check out the Ollie's Bargain Warehouse Field, courtesy of the Cal Ripken Senior Foundation and the great work that Steve Salem, who is the president and CEO of the foundation, has done. It's a wonderful facility. And, you know, for the thanks of, obviously, the foundation, as you mentioned, Speaker Bush wrangling some money out of the... And you mentioned Ollie's Bargain Outlet. Mark Butler is the CEO of Ollie's Bargain Outlet. He's also my board chairman. Okay. And you and talk about a champion for these Where's Ollie's based out of? Are they... Yeah, based out Glenn? of... Their headquarters is in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Okay. They've got probably 230 stores now. Uh, See, no, I thought that was a much more local... Well, it probably uh, was know. at one point. You know, it's probably it is, I just never lived in the areas where they are. It is a major... Here. It's become a major corporation, publicly traded. I'm so blessed to have Mark as our board chairman. This guy just gives and gives and gives. As you can see, it baits. Absolutely. Well, if you're not familiar with it, go out there, check it out. It's a, a beautiful facility. Go out there and play on it because that's what it's that's what it's meant for. Uh, Steve Salem, thank you very much for coming in on this rainy day down to Annapolis. Uh, best of luck. And uh, anytime you want to come back, anytime to talk about the good thank stuff you. that the Ripken Senior Foundation is doing. I want to bring Cal next time or Billy next time with you. Bring him along. We've got an extra chair and we can go from there. Yeah, they explain baseball to me. I don't follow it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, guys. Thanks. Thanks.
And that was Steve Salem. We were talking baseball. Okay, you know, I totally didn't realize the scope of this this whole thing. The ability fields just really blew my mind. That's pretty cool. And that's the problem, I think, when you have a disabled child or something, uh, or you, you yourself is disabled, is that there's an economy to scale when it comes to these sort of projects that you're not going, there's not that big of a need in a concentrated area because people tend to be spread out. So I think it's really cool that they, they build those fields. It really is. It's um, and, they're, and they're doing such great work. And then, as you mentioned, I mean, they're like in, they've got presences in North Dakota and you know, pretty much all over the country. And off air, we talked a little bit about how unassuming Cal Ripken is. Mm -hmm. And they say, we'll go into a place and he'll be like, yeah, no, don't, I don't want any press releases saying that I'm coming to to make a speech or make a presentation or an award or anything like that. He says, you can tell him after I'm gone, but I don't want this whole big... He's a huge dude, like physically. I was at, back in June, I was getting a suit at Nordstrom. I was getting it hemmed and he was standing next to me and he, I didn't realize how big that guy is. Oh, he's tall. He's tall. Like just big. I mean, I'm a tall guy. I'm 6'3", and I think he got a couple inches on me and just like broad shoulders. He, he's a big guy. That's why you don't hold the world record for the longest number of games played in baseball and why you can't play baseball. But I didn't try, in all fairness. <laughs> I didn't know there was a contest. If there was a contest, I might have given it a shot. No one told me that that was a thing, and yeah. I hate baseball. That's right. I don't they, hate baseball. I just never got into they it. They probably yeah, tor- steered you toward basketball or something like that. I, did, I love basketball. <laughs> I mean, football, but I was too skinny. But yeah, definitely check out uh, ripkinfoundation.org and look at all the great stuff they're doing. And separate from the Ripken Foundation, the Cal Ripken Senior Foundation, they do have Ripken Baseball, and you can Google that. And my son did that several years ago when he was little, where it's these baseball clinics. And I mean, it's a pay, go attend a camp, but boy, it is a worthwhile, it's an expensive, but it's a worthwhile camp. If, you're, if your child is has some serious talent or is seriously interested in baseball, I would definitely recommend both of those. But definitely check out ripkinfoundation.org, see what they're all about, and see if you know, if there's something that you want to get involved with or maybe to write a check for. You remember, I don't know, have, have former athletes always been like this or is it kind of a new thing where they have all these foundations? Because remember that, he, I guess he was a Pittsburgh Steeler. I can't remember his name, but he had that camp out for like juvenile delinquents, you know, or whatever mm-hmm. they're called now, where they came and worked on his camp. And like, he, it was like the tough love sort of thing. Right. And I'm trying to remember his name. He, he was a Pittsburgh Steeler. And that was back in like the early 80s. And I just don't remember them, like former athletes being as active when I was a kid as they are now. That's a different, it's a different world too that we live in now. I think, I, I think they realize that the... I mean, a lot of it's PR, like when you're in the sports. I mean, you, <laughs> when you're already, when you're playing and everything, a lot of that's PR, a lot of it's marketing, which is fine. I mean, it just if you're doing good. But a lot of the guys who come out of it are really Really give back. I well, think let's, let's, let's be real because in the days gone by, I mean, you didn't have free agency. You didn't have the salaries that we're, we're seeing now. Okay. So you played baseball, you earned a good living and you retired and you, you know, if you played football, you hoped you didn't have a concussion and die an early death. But yeah, I mean, you've got salaries, you've got the ability to, we're much more smart about savvy about managing our money. And I think that in the case of the Ripken Foundation, here's a guy that was found a way to honor his father, uh, had the wherewithal, the money to, you know, let's get this done and, and to really make a difference and continues to do it. And I think it's just, I think it's just a wonderful thing. Well, shift your gears for a second. Let's talk a little bit about the crab cakes we have coming up. Yes. Yes. You have been a busy, busy boy. Yeah, I have. Uh, I've been talking with all of the aldermanic candidates for the city of Annapolis. All of them, there's a ton. Yeah, there's uh, 19, but two of them haven't responded yet. Um, but by the end of this week, I will have everybody uh, recorded. And what we do is probably Monday or Tuesday of next week, I will release all of them at one time within about 15 minute increments. And the reason I'm doing that is just because I don't want to give anybody else the answers or any unfair advantage. Everybody's getting the same questions. So it's all the really same focus thing. So you can really compare candidate to candidate in your ward. They will be identified as what ward they're in, in the title. So when you see a bunch of, you know, new episodes come down on your phone, make sure that you go back into it and say, Hey, I need to uh, look at ward five or ward six or seven or whatever it is and listen to the candidates that were involved there. Uh, I will put that together also on a single post in Ion Annapolis where all of them will be there. Listed and you can as choose your ward, yeah. And you can listen to them all or whatever if you don't uh, want to do that. But uh, just a heads up that that's going to come. So if you're going to look at your phone one day and go, oh my God, what the hell are they doing? That's what we're doing. Yeah, so and, people, and we're using, they're throwing out the term like everyone knows it. So what we have is we put out the crab cakes on occasion, probably a couple of weeks maybe. Uh, and those are smaller episodes than the ones that come down on Thursdays like you listen to today. These that we do are around 
an hour, you know, 59 minutes, a minute to something like that. But the crab cakes generally be between 20 and 30 minutes. Right. And uh, so, you know, I have one uh, on composting, uh, the Annapolis compost. Uh, there's one on Makerspace, and John's done a ton of them. But John has sat down with every single aldermanic candidate, and we have all these crab cakes coming out. So, like John says, you're going to get flooded, but... It's all for a good reason. Absolutely. And you know what? I was just looking at the calendar because I, I, still, I still do old school with like the episodes. I want a paper calendar. Yeah. And I noticed that this one is 51. Oh. Uh, so you know what that means? That means that we have drinking episode coming up. The next, next one is a year. That's a drinking episode. Yeah. Who should we drink with? Don't tell. Right. Make them tune in to find out. No, oh, that's called a teaser where I come from. That's it. The cliffhanger. All right. You want to end it or you want me to? I thought we just did. Bye. This has been the Maryland Crabs podcast with Tim Hamilton and John Fernay. Sure to follow them in all the regular places, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and online at themarylandcrabs.com. Take a moment to rate us on iTunes. Now get the hell out of my kitchen. Seriously, go! You're still here? It's over. Go home. Go.